Welcome to the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast with your host, Phil Hawkins and Asai Calderon Muñiz. Welcome back to yet another episode. We continue our walk through different parts of the bio biochemistry section of the MCAT. And today we get to talk about one of perhaps my favorite topics in general. I don't know about you, Phil, but Mm -hmm. food. I like food. And that means that we have a very fun, and hopefully you do too. And that means we have a fun chance to talk about digestion today. Yeah. And, and how the MCAT tests it. Um, I feel like everyone loves food. Um, so I feel like, you know, this is, this is a, an episode that is going to resonate with everyone. Um, I know at the end we're planning on doing a walkthrough of a taco and like what happens to a taco. Um, and I'm actually getting really hungry and I think I might need tacos for lunch after this, but, um, we're going to talk like, what's really interesting about digestion is like we eat a lot of different stuff and they're different kind of molecules and how our body deals with those different kind of molecules is different like just makes sense. So we have like carbohydrates, we have proteins, we have lipids, right? Like a stick of butter, my body deals with that different than like, uh, like a pixie stick. And that deals with that different than a piece of steak. And so how our body deals with all of these different things, we want to kind of like do a quick walkthrough of each of them. Um, and specifically how the MCAT is going to test it. And so we're going to start with protein, protein, um, and just kind of like what's going on when you have like a piece of steak or a piece of fish or something like that. Note that most muscle is protein, um, but there is also a lot of protein in like beans and things like that. And so it's possible to get like plenty of protein in your diet. If you're a vegan or vegetarian, um, it isn't just meat, but Meat is so much protein um, that that's probably where most people are getting the most of their protein. So we're going to kind of like talk about it from that perspective. Um, You don't really break up proteins that much like in your mouth. I mean, like you do chew it into pieces, um, which is technically digestion. Digestion just means to break it into smaller pieces. Um, But most of like protein is also one of the hardest things for your body to break down because it's, it's just structurally, it's more difficult to break into pieces. And so we actually start on that in the stomach. That's pretty much all that's going on in the stomach is this like breakdown of proteins in terms of digestion. Um, One of the big players in that is something called pepsin cleaves peptide bonds. And so that makes it easy to kind of remember that. Um, And that is, uh, plays a really big role in that. Like the stomach is kind of interesting though, because it's so acidic. And so pepsin is an interesting enzyme because all enzymes have a certain pH that they tend to work well in, but pepsin is, is a much more acidic pH than most enzymes. Like a neutral pH, pepsin doesn't really do much, but in a super acidic environment, it does. Um, there's a couple of things I want to talk about kind of within that. And First off, most of our proteases in our body, most things that cut up proteins in terms of digestion are zymogens. So zymogen, that's a special term that you need to know for the MCAT. It's an enzyme that is inactive until you like cleave off like a, I want to say like a tag, like there's a a chunk of the protein that's got like something you got to cleave it off in order to activate it. I think about like buying a pair of sunglasses, right? Like you can't use it until you take the tag off. It's kind of the same thing with zymogens. Like they're unusable. They don't work until you remove the tag from them. And there's a, there's a reason for this. Like pretty much all the proteases, trypsin, chymotrypsin, uh, pepsin, they exist in a zymogen form. Those zymogen forms, like the forms that are inactive, we call chymotrypsinogen, trypsinogen, and pepsinogen. So if you ever see something that says ogen at the end, there's probably a pretty good chance it's a zymogen. Um, But the reason for this is these are things, these are enzymes designed, designed to chew up meat, designed to chew up proteins. And we are mostly meat, right? Like I am made of meat. I'm pretty much the same thing as a steak. And so I have stuff in my body designed to chew up steak into tiny little bitty pieces. And I'm made of steak. And that's that's dangerous, right? Like if I release some of that like pepsin or trypsin or any of those other weird proteases just into like my arms or my legs, it would chew up the, that, the muscle tissue and break it into tiny pieces. And so we store those as zymogens. And so I always think about like, like it's like a dog with a muzzle on it. And like, you keep, you keep this protein muzzled and then you put it where it needs to go. And then you take the muzzle off and you run away. Um, And so like, that's, what's going on with, with pepsin is you stick it into the stomach in it's inactive form. 
and then you activate it. And then like it's in the stomach and like any meat that shows up there, it's going to get chewed up and broken and digested into like tons of little pieces. And that's, that's something that is um, kind of, kind of unique to zymogens. Um, or to proteases in like the digestive tract. There are some other zymogens in the body for sure, but like pretty much all the major proteases in your digestive tract are zymogens. That's something important to understand. Yeah. There's so much there to unpack. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, So I want to make sure that we, we touch on something more general first. um, And that's what you were talking about, that there are multiple types of digestion, right? So there's the the physical breakdown. So that mechanical digestion that's happening when you're chewing, um, it also does happen in the stomach, right? Because if you think about it, the stomach is constantly churning and moving things. Um, and that's part of why it's such a strong, um, strong entity, but then also there's this chemical digestion, right? And so don't forget either when you're prepping for the MCAT, because you don't want to miss something that you actually know. You don't want to miss a question that you actually know, uh, because I would be this person that does that. So that's why I'm letting you guys know. Yeah. Um, And there's also like this interesting thing with like the hydrochloric acid as like playing a role. Cause like there's, there's bacteria and fungi and stuff just in the air all the time. Um, and so like, I know it sounds kind of gross, but like, when you eat anything, it's covered in bacteria and like, and like spores and like fungi, like little particles. That's why you can like leave something out like a, like a gallon of milk or like ice cream or man, I'm just hungry. Um, or like orange juice and it will like get colonized with different stuff. Like orange juice might get colonized with yeast and start to ferment over time. And then you have like orange wine, which sounds kind of gross now that I think about it, but, um, we're constantly like eating stuff from the environment. And so our stomach is so acidic that most bacteria cannot survive that. So it's kind of like a defense, right? A defensive wall there. Like things end up in this boiling pot of acid. Um, it's not boiling because it's body temperature, but like it is this, you know, roiling um, container of acid. That everything's kind of like jumbled around and making sure that acid's getting to everything. There are certain bacteria that can colonize that though. This is one of my favorite I'm such a nerd. This is one of my favorite Nobel prizes um, that has ever existed is there were uh, two Australian scientists, uh, Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, that were, they thought that ulcers were created by bacteria. And they're like, we think, we think ulcers are made by bacteria and all the like medical communities like, no, it's a stress thing. And they're like, no, we think it's bacteria. And everyone's like, no, it's a, it's a stress response has nothing to do with bacteria. And Barry Marshall was like, no, I think it's bacteria. And so he collected this bacteria and drank it and he gave himself an ulcer. And like, he got an ulcer because this bacteria helicobacter pylori um, could survive the acidic environment and colonize and like create like basically an infection in the wall of the, of the stomach. And so um, after he did this, he's like, listen, I think it's bacteria. And everyone's like, no. And so he like drank the bacteria and then got an ulcer. Everyone's like, Ooh, you know what? Maybe they are made by bacteria. And so it's like a famous case of this guy um, figuring figuring out kind of what happened here. And he actually experimented on, on himself, which I don't recommend. Um, but he won the Nobel Prize in 2005 for discovering the cause of ulcers. Um, so I think it's important to understand that that like that defense that we have to deal with, you know, the outside world, it isn't perfect. Um, there are some bacteria that can actually survive in that hyperacidic environment. Um, that's related to ulcers as well. The stomach is truly an interesting and remarkable place. Um, you know, you have, like you said, this insanely acidic environment, think pH like two, Mm -hmm. um, and you have to, it in part, right. It's forming part of your, um, like your ability to maintain a, an intact immune system, right. And not constantly get sick every time you eat something. Um, but it also has to just constantly be ready for whatever you throw at it. And it also has to be able to, um, break down a lot, right. It mm-hmm. starts the breakdown process. And so for proteins, uh, since we were just talking about proteins, proteins, you start that initial breakdown, right. In, in the mouth mechanically. Um, but it really isn't until the stomach that you start breaking it down chemically. Right. And so, um, This is in contrast to other macromolecules like carbohydrates. So unlike proteins, carbohydrates are broken down a little bit um, chemically in the mouth. So you're going to have these 
enzymes called um, uh, saccharidases that are going to, and uh, amylase, um, salivary amylase specifically in the mouth that are going to break down sugars. And so they're going to break them down into two and three chain, um, you know, di and trisaccharides. And so that's happening at the level of the mouth. Once you hit the stomach though, you're not breaking down the sugars or the carbohydrates any further. So you have this kind of separation between when some macromolecules are broken down first, you know, some are first in the mouth, some are first in the stomach. Um, there's also something really interesting with that idea. So what's really cool is that while you can't tell, right, you can't notice a change in, you know, flavor or anything like that due to breakdown in protein in your mouth because it's not happening, you would be able to detect a change in um, the breakdown of how or the sweetness of something if it's just in your mouth, right? Because that's where your taste buds are. That's where your taste receptors are. Mm -hmm. So has anyone ever had regular milk and then had to switch over to lactate or lactose-free milk? you'll probably realize that there's a slight difference in flavor. There's a slight difference in how sweet it tastes. Does that mean that sugar was added to the lactose-free milk? No, it means they added an enzyme that does the same thing. It breaks down the sugar. And so now you're tasting what feels to be more sweet because now you have the individual sugar molecules. Sugar molecules. Right? Yeah, because your taste receptors won't work on like polysaccharides. It's like individual like monomers and dimers that tend to activate your glucose or your sweet receptors in your mouth. And so the breakdown makes it sweeter. Exactly. And so since you're being, uh, since in your mouth, you know, when you're breaking down these carbohydrates, it's being broken down into di and trisaccharides, right? You're able to, to taste that. So it's something that's really cool that can even just show you on a daily, you know, something you do every day that you can realize, oh, this is like how my body is breaking down my food, even when it's just in my mouth. Right. Um, so unlike, um, so like I mentioned, like, unlike the, um, the proteins, it starts off pretty quickly. Um, this continues in the, in the, um, GI system. So you have mouth, esophagus, stomach, right. Then you're actually going to have the pancreas release. Like you already mentioned, Phil, a lot of enzymes. And so these enzymes are going to be released by the pancreas into the next part, the duodenum, right. All of this, this food, this chyme is going to be neutralized, it's going to move into the small intestine. There are going to be additional enzymes at the um, brush border of the small intestine that are going to continue breaking down carbohydrates. And so they are similar versions of what you have in your mouth. And so that's going to be the case for carbohydrates. Now we can't break down all types of carbohydrates. The examples we've been using are things that, you know, you, you can break down. Think about something like celery. <laughs> Celery is one of those very polarizing foods. Either you like it or you do not. Um, part of why some people don't like it is, you know, maybe it doesn't have a flavor, but it's also very stringy. You don't break that down. That's fiber. So that fiber, your body, you do not have the appropriate enzymes to break it down, but you do have bacteria that are able to break down, um, break down these types of, of carbohydrates that we can't. And so they can serve as, um, pro and prebiotics. So they help, uh, nourish the microbiome, right? The, the gut bacteria, the ones that we like. Um, and so even though it's not maybe as much food for you, it's food for your microbiome. Um, yeah. I, I feel like that's, I always, when, you know, you're eating a piece of celery and be like, Oh, I'm feeding my pets. Um, <laughs> like that bacteria that lives in my, lives in my intestine. It is weird to think about that. Like like fiber or is, or cellulose is actually the exact same thing as just pure sugar. It's just how the molecules are attached to each other. And so there are, there's a lot of, uh, food that we have that is full of carbohydrates, but that carbohydrate is fiber. And so we don't get any calories from it. Um, it's actually an interesting thing to like, look at anytime you guys, uh, like go to the grocery store, or, like look at just a nutrition label, it'll say like total carbohydrates and then it'll say fiber. And so if something's got like 20 grams of carbs, but 15 grams of that is fiber, like you're only really getting five grams of carbohydrates that you are digesting and getting energy from the other 15 is, is for your pets, um, the bacteria that live in your intestine. And then, so this is with carbs. There's also a whole other class of macromolecules that we haven't touched on yet. Yeah. And so that's where the, the like lipids come in, which is 
like fats and oils and things like that. And so these also do get broken down a little bit in your mouth. I actually just learned about this um, because I feel like for the longest time, like people just focused on the salivary amylase that breaks down sugars, but there are also lingual lipases. Lingual means tongue um, in case you're, in case you're wondering like linguistics, like how many, how many languages do you speak? How many tongues do you speak? Linguistics. Um, so there's also lingual lipa lipases, um, that start to break down lipids. Now, most of the lipids that we interact with are like triglycerides. So you have like a glycerol and then three fatty acid chains. Um, that's how we see most oils, like olive oil. That's how we see like butter, things like that. Um, and so, that stuff, it starts to get broken down a little bit in our mouth. And then it really doesn't get messed with at all until it gets to the intestines, just like carbohydrates. Like it starts a little bit in the mouth and then it's way more in the intestines. Um, so in the intestines, you have a bunch of lipases as well um, that can um, you know, kind of break this triglyceride into a bunch of individual fatty acids and glycerol molecules. Um, something that's kind of interesting though is lipids, like oils, like those don't mix with water very well. And so like, you know, if I, I shouldn't do this, but if I like drank a cup of olive oil and drank a cup of water in my stomach, those would not mix. I'd end up with two layers, right? Like I'd have like a layer of oil and a layer of water. Don't do this. This sounds gross. Um, salad dressing y'all think yeah, of salad, salad dressing. dressing. There we go. <laughs> That's actually got like oil and water in it. So like we've got the little like drop you, uh, droplets in there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what, this is kind of a problem because all of our lipases are, they're made of amino acids, they're proteins. And so they're fairly hydrophilic. And so they dissolve in water. And so all of our things that chew up fats are dissolved in the water. All the fat is not in the water. And so we end up with like two layers, the stuff that chews it up. And then the stuff that needs to be chewed up are not ever in the same place. And so that creates a problem. And so what do, you, what do we need to do with this? We need to emulsify, which is a fancy word to say, mix the fats and oils or mix the water and the oils together. Um, and so the way we do that is via bile. So bile is this really interesting molecule that's got a polar end and a non-polar end. But given the way that it is organized, like it doesn't stack really well. It kind of wants to form balls, right? Because the hydrophobic area is smaller than the hydrophilic area. And we want the hydrophilic stuff to interact with water. And so what happens if you add an emulsificant like bile or soap, it's the same thing, um, that will like take all of our oil and fats and create like a ball that we call a micelle. And the inside is where all the fat stuff is. And the outside is the polar ends of the bile. And so all of a sudden, all of the little, like these two layers of the, the oil and the water become like just little bubbles of, of fat that dissolve in the water. And so now the lipases can get in there and start to break things up. Um, this is also what happens with like soap. Like if you like cook something in a pan and use olive oil, like it's kind of like oily. And if you rinse it out, still oily because like the water and the oil don't mix and the oil doesn't dissolve in the water. But if you add soap, soap packages that oil into little bubbles that floats around in the water. And so the soap will make your pan not oily versus if you don't use soap, then it's going to be kind of oily still afterwards. Um, that's kind of the same thing that's going on in your intestinal system as well with like the fats and your, in your intestines, um, that bile stuff is really interesting because your liver makes a bunch of it and then stores it in the gallbladder. And then like, when you get the signal of like, oh, there's a bunch of food in my intestine, your gallbladder will like kick out all this bile to help emulsify those fats to like get the fats to dissolve in the water. Um, there are people who don't have gallbladders because they have them removed, um, people who have gallstones and things like that. And so in that case, the, the liver is always making bile and just like throwing it into the gallbladder so that it can give a big rush of bile when we need it. Without the gallbladder, the, the liver is still making bile, but it's just kind of like trickling it into the intestines. And so you don't have quite as much bile and people who have their gallbladder removed. Um, I actually had a friend from med school um, who shall remain nameless, um, but um, who was a roommate, actually. And um, he 
was like every Sunday we would do like a big breakfast and like everyone, like we cook and everyone in the house, we'd invite friends from like from med school. And so we'd have like bacon and pancakes and eggs and like all sorts of stuff and just kind of do a big breakfast every weekend. Um, and this friend, uh, had his gallbladder removed partway through the, through the school year. And, um, so the, the next Sunday rolls around and he like eats a whole bunch of bacon. Oh, it didn't, didn't go so well because like his digestive tract, because it wasn't able to give this big influx of bile meant that like it had like less bile. And so he wasn't able to emulsify those fats as well. And so it just really messed with his digestive system. And it was a very unpretty picture on the <laughs> other end where um, things kind of didn't go there. And so people who have their gallbladder removed, have less bile um, are able to like inject less bile at the right time in the digestive tract. And so they have an issue with like fats and oils kind of all together, um, which is kind of an interesting thing. That's actually how, um, and I wish I knew, I wish I remembered the exact name, but there's actually an over-the-counter weight loss drug supplement, whatever you'd like to call it, that all it does is it inhibits your ability to break down fats. So it works, but people don't tolerate it very well for precisely those symptoms. Right. You know, you'd like to be able to live outside of your restroom. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so, exactly. you know, and not, not pass out in the process. Um, so this is actually something that people have tried to, to leverage um, in order to like actually be able to, to lose weight. This is part of the premise as well. If you think about it with a lot of weight loss surgeries, right? So something like a gastric bypass. So when you are taking out, you know, a good piece, when you're taking the, basically you're taking out a good chunk of the small intestine, you're just like bypassing it, right? You are making the stomach go and connect later on. So you're taking out a good chunk of the place where it would have otherwise digested and reabsorbed food. So now you have two things. You can have a situation where they make your stomach smaller so that you can physically hold less, right? Mm -hmm. But you also get rid of a lot of where the food would have been absorbed. And right, so right. it's the same idea of like, you need to be able to break down the food and you need to be able to absorb it. And those are the two biggest things that the, the digestive system does for us. Right. And so they're both really integral parts here. Yeah. Um, that's a super interesting thing of like trying to mess with that as a weight loss thing, especially in America. That's like weight issues are kind of a big deal. That's why if any of you guys become anybody, any of you guys listening, come up with a pill that makes people lose weight, you're going to be a billionaire. Um, please kick some money my way. Um, <laughs> I, I saw you get really excited when I said that. So there's actually, we, we can talk about it offline because I want to know the exact name before I, before I start saying things, but there's actually a medication that was previously used for diabetes that is now being considered as, um, I, th I think it might actually be FDA approved at this point for weight loss in non-diabetic patients, but interesting. Yeah. So uh, have people think about this. This is, this is related. You guys might hear about it on a future podcast, right? Um, <laughs> But yeah, so we've, we've talked a little bit about this digestive component of the, the digestive system. Um, I also want to make sure that we just very quickly remind ourselves, you know, that there is this absorption component. So for, for the purposes of the MCAT, um, you need to understand that at the level of the small intestine, a lot of these uh, molecules are going to be absorbed, right? So glucose, um, fructose, um, fatty acids, amino acids, right? There are different types of transporters in the small intestine that you can be tested on, right? You do need to know the difference between a passive and active transport. You, you do need to know the difference between a symporter, right? Co-transporter, things like that. So and this is just, a, exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is just a reminder in, in this. So we don't forget to tell you, go look that up. It's not going to be fun if we talk about it. So just go ahead and take a peek at that um, and just kind of keep that in mind in the context of, of this. But yeah. I do. I do like that. You kind of talked about like the over or the, the medications that like make you just not absorb fats because like fats are much more energy dense than proteins and carbohydrates. So if, if there's one thing that like slowing down the, the absorption or digestion of something would help you lose weight, it'd probably be lipids. Um, that being said, you do need lipids in your diet. Like that's, that's an integral part of your diet. So you can't just be like, I'm never going to eat a fat because then you'll be dead. Cause remember that all the membranes of your cells, every single cell in your body, it's membrane is made of phospholipids. And so you need lipids in order to build those things, um, and kind of put all of that together. 
if anyone is ever curious, um, I would recommend actually taking a look into it. It it has a potential to be a rabbit hole, so beware. But um, just if someone's curious, there actually is really interesting science on what we eat and mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it gets kind of thrown around like, oh, make sure you're eating well. There are actually like specific nutrients and vitamins and things like that that are um, that like play a role. And I think when I was looking that up, it was something like I think it's estimated that 50 percent. So half of the gray matter in your brain is lipid based. So, you know. You got it. You got to make sure yeah. to, to eat well while you're studying for the MCAT. <laughs> right. Right. I also just, just as a side note, that is like one of the most cutting edge areas of medicine right now is understanding the food and the gut microbiome and how that affects you. Like there's been all sorts of links to certain bacteria in your digestive tract and depression and other things like that. Like, so it's not just about like nutrient stuff. This seems to affect like how your body works, how your brain works and like chemical imbalances and things like that. So it's definitely something to pay a lot of attention to. Um, I did mention that there was like bile, um, like, so bile is made from cholesterol. This is one of my favorite, like interesting things. And so we take this bile and we dump it into our GI tract and then we reabsorb like 90% of it and it goes back into your liver and your liver will reuse that. And so we recycle bile like all the time in our digestive tract, but there are actually drugs designed to make it so that you can't reabsorb bile. And so that means that you're going to poop it out. And so like the bile just leaves your digestive tract. And so your body has to make more bile instead of using the stuff that it recycled. And because bile is made from cholesterol, that means it's going to start to burn through some of your cholesterol to make more bile. And so this is a medication that you take that makes you basically poop out bile but as a result, it lowers your cholesterol. And like so many people have high cholesterol that that's kind of a useful drug. And so understanding kind of like how that works is is pretty interesting overall. And once again, that could be a very easy topic for an MCAT passage. So we've covered quite a bit so far, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I wanna make sure that you guys get an opportunity to synthesize all of this information. And so Phil, you hinted at it earlier. Um, mm-hmm. We are going to do a walkthrough of the digestive system with perhaps one of my personal favorite foods, <laughs> and that is a taco. Um, so um, let's kind of think about, and because I'm really dorky and weird, imagine that you are like sitting in an actual taco, but it has to be a corn tortilla one. It can't be a flour tortilla, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so um, can you tell what preference, what my preference is? Yeah. So... <laughs> So pick whatever, whatever filling you would like. Um, I think I'm going to go for a steak taco. What, what kind of taco would you like to be? I'm, I'm totally doing seafood. I'm okay. doing a fish taco. That's the best. <laughs> so we got a fish taco. Someone be our, our, our veggie taco. Um, yeah. So first, right, we hit the mouth. So we have what type of digestion here? We have mechanical digestion. We have breakdown of some of the corn tortilla with the carbohydrates, right? So we have some sugars in there. We have salivary amylase. It's going to break down some of the carbohydrates there. Um, We have protein, but is the protein getting touched yet? No, right? Just mechanical. Then there's a little bit of fat because, you know, maybe you have some sour cream or maybe you have some some cheese, whatever, kind of whatever you you've plopped onto it at this point. And so you have just a little bit of breakdown of the fat, right? Then one really good, big swallow down your esophagus into your stomach. So now you've entered this really acidic area, right? So you're sitting in your little taco truck, it's coming apart. And what's next, right? So the, the, the tortilla is being mostly left alone, right? The cheese mostly left alone, but now you've hit the fish. Now you've hit your beans. Now you've hit your well, beans also have carbs, but they also have some protein. So we'll use them for our protein here. Um, and now you have your, your steak, right? And so yes, all of this is getting moved around, but now the protein is actually getting broken down by the pepsin, right? So at this point you have a combination of it's really acidic. Your, your taco truck is your, yeah, your taco car, your taco truck is just kind of disintegrating. And now everything has at some level started to be broken down. So now you leave and the pancreas is like, oop, 
the, the, the taco truck arrived. So it sends in its pancreatic enzymes into duodenum. The food leaves the stomach, right? The chyme leaves the stomach and it's neutralized. And so now it's meeting up with these enzymes. We're moving into the small intestine. And so now we have this continual breakdown. And now that we're at the small intestine, we also have these enzymes on the brush border, right? Um, on the, the microvilli. And so now you're going to have this additional leftover breakdown. And now you're going to have the absorption of the macronutrients, right? So you also want to think about, we didn't talk about it just yet, but when we got the signal, when the pancreas got the signal, right, that there was food coming in, so did the gallbladder. So the gallbladder said, hey, there's some cheese there, right? Released the, um, the bile. And so that helped emulsify everything. So we were able to actually effectively break down all three of those major macromolecules that we talked about today, the uh, proteins, the carbohydrates, and the lipids. And why didn't we break ourselves down in the process? Because the um, enzymes that were stored in the pancreas were stored as zymogens. So they were inactive until they reached their destination and their target taco. Yeah. And then we take off the muzzle. I'm like, go to town, break it into exactly. pieces. Yeah. And we didn't talk about this large intestine, right? We're not doing really absorption there. We're doing like water reabsorption. We're trying to just form actual stool rectum and beyond, you know what you got to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know where, you know where that goes. Um, but yeah, I like, I think that's really important to kind of like think about kind of how it all works together and how, like, by the time you get to the stomach, like you've started digestion on kind of everything there. Um, it also takes like way more energy to break down the proteins kind of overall, which is why it spends a big chunk of time in the stomach, um, if it needs to. And I know we've, I've just kind of like, we've just kind of mentioned like the pancreatic enzymes, but there's a lot of them. Um, I don't think you need to know all of them. Like you don't need to know what's going on with like the carboxypeptidases versus amino peptidases. Um, I haven't seen the MCAT test anything like at that level, but note that the, the pancreas has enzymes that cut down pretty much everything like proteins, lipids, like carbohydrates. Um, and the small intestine, like the duodenum is where most of the digestion and kind of breakdown occurs. Um, and you did also mention it, but there's also some, uh, sodium bicarbonate from there as well, which acts as a base. And so it's that base from the pancreas that's neutralizing all of that acid from the stomach. So it's kind of interesting. A lot of that pepsin that is in our stomach, like that passes into our small intestine, but then it like stops working because it's pepsin only really works in this hyperacidic environment. Um, and so that pepsin is in your later portions of the digestive tract, but just can't do anything because it only works under like certain conditions. And because as fun as these are, we always try and make sure that you leave with an understanding of like what you'll see on test day. Um, we've talked about what questions related to this you can get. I also want you, you know, we also want you guys to start thinking about if you see a passage on digestion in general, what types of topics might they ask about, right? They might absolutely ask about the digestive system. You've heard us talking about different transporters. You've heard us talking about different enzymes. You've heard us talking about different macromolecules, right? There's some uh, endocrinology in there. So home hormones. Um, there are a lot of ways that they can branch off with just a passage on eating a taco, which is probably not what they would do, but maybe they should do that. Um, but so we want you guys to just, as you're studying, especially with, you know, the sciences, look and try and find connections between topics. That's going to make you a lot more agile, a lot easier for you to make those connections on test day and say, oh, they're asking about this. I noticed that they had a line about something about enzymes in here. So I might get a question on enzymes, right? And that's just doing that now as you're studying will make it easier to replicate that when you're testing. Mm -hmm. 